Okay, good. So um, today we'll talk about, uh, uh, say, how to use the web technology that we learned uh, in the previous couple of weeks uh, to support the integration of different uh, devices and different uh, computational nodes in our architecture. So up to now, web technology were used uh, for creating user interfaces. Uh, so we learned uh, how to create a set of pages, how to integrate them with the database and to make uh, the interface more or less uh, nice looking. Uh, right now, we will learn how to use the same kind of technologies in a different way uh, to uh, enable different uh, nodes to exchange data. So instead of inventing it uh, from scratch again, so uh, to in defining every time new protocols to let different computers communicate with each other, we use the existing web uh, uh, protocols in a different way. So what uh, we need to do today is to understand a bit more about uh, the HTTP protocol. Uh, we just used it, uh, we saw very briefly you know, that, it had, that it has a header and body part and different uh, comments. We, we learned it b better uh, to understand more details about this protocol and especially the list of comments that it supports that are mostly unused, not used for um, uh, interactive application but they become very useful for this kind of uh, um, distributed system integration. And then we learn how to design uh, uh, this kind of integrated services uh, using, a, um, say, an architectural style, which is called the REST. That will be the main focus of today's uh, discussion. And uh, in, the, in the next hour, and the second hour of today, we we'll see uh, some example of application of this kind of uh, choices. So, uh, first of all, let's uh, dive into HTTP hmm, with uh, more detail than you really know or want to see. But uh, uh, okay, we already know that um, uh, HTTP is the protocol huh, gluing together all the uh, internet, all the websites, and uh, actually, it's defined, uh, HTTP protocol is defined in this uh, RFC document, which is surprisingly short and, and easy to read. Hmm. In many cases, protocols are very complex, but in this case, a simple one, if you want, it's just a, a very short read and uh, it gives you all the details about uh, this protocol. We already know uh, that it's a basically memoryless uh, message exchange protocol. So there is a couple of messages that are sent in every HTTP interaction. One is called the request message and the other is the response. Hmm? Um, that are to be exchanged, of course, over a TCP IP connection. Every message, so both the request message and the response message, are made of two parts, hmm? uh, a header part and a body part. The body may be optional in some cases, so the body is missing for some kind of messages. So both the message going and the message returning back are mainly defined by a header, uh, and the other contains an initial line, a first line with a special format, and then a set of other header lines uh, that are always in the format uh, key column value. Hmm? Uh, and this list can be long, arbitrarily long, depending, depending on, ma on how many properties uh, you need to specify. This is valid both for the request, uh, where we know that the browser fills some request headers, and also for the response, where the web server fills some response headers. And then there may be a body, and if the body is present, it's separated from the header simply by a blank line, an empty line. So it's very simple. Uh, we have a very simple format for the messages, all text-based, actually, and uh, with just one uh, line of separation. Okay, we already saw some examples. Uh, the, the, the first line is what makes the request uh, different from the response. Huh? So in the uh, request message, the first line contains three different fields. The first is the, is the command. The second is the resource, the page that we want. And the third is the protocol level, HTTP 1.1, for example, here. Uh, in the response, we have the first field that is the protocol level, 
And the second and third fields are the response status. The second field is the response status in a numerical format, and the third one is the response status in text format. Actually, it's a redundant information. If you just have the numerical format, uh, it would be enough. Hmm? The other is just a readable one, just for helping you debug the packets. Uh, the protocol level is not very interesting to us because right now all the web requests you should use the HTTP 1.1 uh, protocol version. Uh, it would be useful if, for example, your browser only supports, for some reason, version 1.0. It tells the server to respond with a uh, very, uh, with, with an older version of the protocol. But right now, it's, uh, we, we don't need to negotiate the protocol level because we all use 1.1, uh, at least until version 2.0 will become accepted and mainstream, which is currently uh, under development. Um, what we are more interested in here today is the command and the resource, because we want to use and abuse in some way this set of commands and resources to do something different from retrieving web pages. Okay, um, well, these are just the details of uh, what we, we just said. Uh, so the first word of the first line of every HTTP request is always one of these commands in the HTTP methods. So an HTTP request is always a request for one of these methods. Uh, we already know that most of the re requests uh, use the get method. So get is a request for retrieving a copy of a resource on a different server. Usually it will be an image or an HTML page, maybe also a dynamic HTML page, we don't care. So we name the resource that we want, slash index.html. This is the name of a resource, and the get method retrieves uh, the, a representation of that resource. So it retrieves a file uh, that corresponds to the content of that resource that we named in the request. And uh, um, by definition, the get command can be repeated without side effects. Uh, in fact, it's a reading operation. I want a copy of that. So ideally, if I issue the same get command several times in a row, I would get identical responses. Of course, is the if the data in the backend in the database hasn't changed. Hmm? So, Repeating a get doesn't cause any problems usually because it's something that implies just retrieving information which is there and should not have any side effects. Uh, head is, is like get, no, the head method is like a get method, while the difference is just uh, I don't, uh, where I only want to retrieve the header of the response and not the full body. Basically, it can be used to check whether the resource is there, whether the web page is responding, whether the web server is online. Because then we don't get the body, we don't get the, uh, the resource, we only get the information about the resource, the header of the response. Then we have a set of uh, uh, dangerous methods. Methods that send information from the browser to the server. Uh, they, I, I call them dangerous because uh, usually the effect of these methods is to change something on the server side. When I submit a post, so the post method is mostly used to send data from forms. When I submit a form data, usually I'm asking the server to do something, to create new data, to insert new information, and so on. And um, uh, the a post method is thought to send a body of information to the request. The post is one of the few uh, methods that has actually a, a request body. So when, when I'm sending a post, I'm sending the, the request headers, of course, but also request body. And the request body is the content of the post. A very similar semantics is uh, from the uh, put method. Uh, put is 
never used in interactive. Browsers, web browsers don't use those. Web browsers just use uh, the first three, head, get, and port. They are enough for navigating for browsing web pages. But then the protocol defines these new ones, uh, and put is again for sending information to a server. The semantic difference between post and put is that post uh, sends new data and put uh, usually uploads new information for existing data. So it's a sort of updating. Hmm? It's more an update than uh, creating new. Then we have also a delete method that can be used to delete a resource. Hmm? It's something that you normally that doesn't happen. We, I, I don't connect to a website to say delete slash index.html. Well, I can send this command. It will be a perfectly valid HTTP message, request message, but then the web server will most likely reply permission denied. Uh, you cannot, uh, you are not authorized to delete the, the, the home page of the, web, of the website. So it's not normally used, but in a wider context, uh, we will use this verse. The other ones are mainly for um, debugging, for example, for Trace saying, okay, let, let me see how the request is, uh, is, um, is um, opted and, uh, and the options are for querying a web, servers, a web server about its capabilities and so on. So the four last ones are practically not used except in debugging or uh, in uh, the connect method just for encryption of the, of the, of the connection. Mm -hmm. So we focus on the first, uh, except for add, uh, the first four, get, post, put, and delete. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, about the response, mm -hmm. well, the response is easy to pass. We have a first line with just the protocol version and the response code. Let's have a look at the response code. Uh, the HTTP specification specifies five different, different groups of response codes. All of them are in, on three digit, three, de three digit, dec decimal digit. Hmm? And uh, so the ones uh, in the 100 range uh, are informational messages, just for give you information. They are, for example, the, re the response of a head over an options call, then they only give you information. The two codes are for success. So when a request has been honored correctly, when the request has been executed correctly according to what has been requested, then the web server will respond with a 200 code, 200 something code. Um, this is both for a get, when I request 200, when I respond with 200, if I am actually sending you back the file that you requested, and also for a post, for example, if the form data is accepted without, without parsing errors, for example. So a post doesn't need to return a body necessarily, but then the response can be, in any case, okay, positively executed. The 300 range is for redirections. Means that the browser, it, it, sorry, the server is telling to the browser, yes, the request you did is okay, but please make it to a different address. So the address of the resource you requested is not is longer valid, is not the correct one, and so please, browser, ask another one. I, I'm telling you that this resource should be changed, the address of the resource should be changed, so I'm redire redirecting your request to a new resource. It can be used for, for, for several reasons. And, uh, and the four and five uh, error, um, response code ranges are from errors. So when the request cannot be satisfied. Even in the three cases, uh, the request is not immediately satisfied, but then the server will tell you the name of a different resource that will hopefully uh, be positive, it lead to a 200 code. In four and five, the request cannot be complete, completed hmm? in any case, for different reasons. Some may be client errors, 
So the request is not valid. There is syntax error in the request, for example. It's not complete. It refers to a non-existing resource. The, the, the protocol syntax is wrong or for some reason. So for some reason, this request cannot be, can never be uh, satisfied. Or the request is perfectly valid, but uh, the server currently is not able to handle it. Is not able to respond due to internal errors, due to programming errors, so the, the application crashes, uh, generates an exception, the database connection is not valid, uh, or, 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 other, or other reasons, okay? The database is not connected, is not uh, running, and so on. So a 500 error means that something is wrong with the application server and can be corrected. So you could retry it later by hoping that some, the error has been corrected. So the request will be perfectly valid, but the server in this moment um, is not uh, uh, able to respond. Okay, these are the main categories, and for each of them, different uh, um, actual messages are defined. So the ones that we see more often, of course, are the 200, uh, which is the okay response, is the, is the normal response. We see usually a 404 when the request contains a resource name that doesn't exist. So it's a error in the request, and uh, the server did not find uh, the corresponding re resource uh, to send back. And then maybe the, gener the generic uh, internal server error method in the 500 area. Hmm? There may also be, for example, 204, no content. So when you're sending a post, and the post sends some data from the browser to the server, the server just gets the data and doesn't reply with any HTML page. Hmm? So the request is satisfied because the, the post has been successful but there's no web page in response. So it may also be used at 204. And then there are the 300, uh, the moved resource. When we um, use the, the redirection in our Flask code, in our Python exercises, uh, when we wanted to redirect a response to a different page, you remember when we did the login and the logout, uh, uh, we didn't have actually an HTML page hmm, to send back to the, to the browser, so we decided to ask the browser to go directly to the home page, and then the home page would be changed. So in that case, the post message, the request that was sent, was then replied, was then executed, and then the, uh, the, the, the server replied with a 302 code. So the resource has been found, so the, the request was valid, but please go to a different address. Now, request a different address. And the browser obeys and requests a new index page that will be updated. So this is for doing this sort of shortcuts in our application, generating temporary redirects. Otherwise, uh, the redirect mechanism can also be used uh, for um, you know, for example, you know a link shortness, uh, how they work. You, know? you have a lot of links like bit.ly or goo.gl and so on that give you a short code for, for a URL. And, and how they work is when you go to that web page, you get a 301 response with the full address of the real page that you want to go, hmm? where you want to go. So it's a way of remapping one URL to another one. Uh, it's also useful when you are sort of restructuring your, your website. So something that was in a section, you want to move it to a different section, but you want, don't want to break all the links that are pointing to your website. So you, you keep the old addresses valid, but you just put a short redirection command to the new remapped address. So that all the old links continue to work, all the um, search engines uh, understand the, the equivalence between the old address and the new address, and they will bring your, let's say, ranking page 
uh, forward to the new address. So they can be used in this way. The permanent, permanently attribute here means that the browser is authorized to remember this redirection. So next time you try to go to the first page, the browser might decide to go directly to the second one because it knows that this is a permanent redirection. So it's able to, it allows the browser to cache you know, this information. In the other cases, no. The browser, is, if it's a, a, um, a temporary redirection, the browser will not cache it. So every time you go through the redirect, it depends on what you want to achieve. Okay. Um, then we usually don't care, no? uh, because we don't have to implement a browser or to support the whole uh, uh, protocol about uh, the headers and that are um, available both in the request and in the responses. Uh, this is just a full list of the standard headers uh, defined in the, in the request. The only one that is mandatory is host. Uh, that is a copy of the name of a web server host. Uh, it's using the physical web server. It's hosting different virtual sites, so sites with uh, different addresses, but they reside all this on the same machine. This host field is able to um, demultiplex uh, between them, no? to, to select one of them. So it's the only uh, mandatory field but usually it's already uh, compiled automatically for us. And also we have a set of standard headers in the response uh, that we can, okay, we, they, they can be said, these are the, the, the main, uh, say, uh, important ones. And then we have a set of headers that are common, that may be used both in the request and the response. Uh, in particular, we have all the data, uh, we we'll have all the, the cookie related uh, uh, um, headers and so on. Mm -hmm. But we don't need today, we don't need actually to, to go into these details of the protocol mm -hmm. uh, for, for say, the usage that we'll define in, the, um, uh, in our applications. About the body. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very both for the request body and for the response body, but um, usually we think about the response body we, because it's always there, it's nearly always there, and the request is only in some cases. Uh, there should be a mechanism, there is a mechanism, for specifying the type of data that has been transferred. So the HTTP protocol by itself doesn't specify the format of the body. It only says that the body should start after a blank line. But, but after a blank line, I could have the, the bytes, the text bytes of an HTML page. I could have uh, the text for a CSS file. I could have uh, the binary bytes, the binary content of a JPEG image or a PDF file. Hmm? So there's nothing by itself that specifies how these uh, bytes, huh, how this response body should be interpreted. We can't even rely, say, so reliable on, so reliably, uh, on the file extension, okay? Because we, we, it's not been transferred. The extension is just on the request, but maybe the server will send back uh, some resource which is on a different format. So. What happens is that uh, the format of the file is declared according to a so-called MIME type, no? a type. Uh, the uh, content type is uh, a string that describes uh, uh, the format of the data being transferred. And there is a standard list of uh, so-called uh, uh, MIME type internet media types um, that are composed mainly of two parts, the type and the subtype. So for example, text slash plain is a type, means text is a type, plain is a subtype. Uh, text plain is just a, a simple text file, like you cannot uh, work uh, write in Notepad, for example. 
text slash HTML is a, again a text document, but internally the document is formatted in, a, in HTML. So the browser should interpret the result according to the HTML syntax, huh? and so on. So all the text formats are subtypes of the general text type. Hmm? Then you have a main image type, you may have an audio type, you may have a video main type, and so on. And for every main type, you may have different subtypes. So these are just some examples of the uh, inter intermediate types that you can find. So every time a resource is returned by the server, then the server must tag this resource with a proper type. And it's open. Uh, the HTTP protocol doesn't care about the content, about the format. So you can define new format, and as long as the browser understands them, then you can transfer them over HTTP. The HTTP protocol doesn't care. The HTTP server doesn't care either. It's only saying it only needs to, the HTTP server only needs to attach the proper MIME type uh, to the document, hmm? to the response in the response uh, headers. Uh, Text, image, audio, and video are usually standard types. They're taken from some standard text formats or standard image formats and so on. And then you have a whole uh, fifth type of main type, which is called application, uh, in which you may have different, uh, uh, say, um, custom format, proprietary pro format defined by uh, specific commands. Huh? Uh, some of them have a VND prefix, VND dot something, VND stands for vendor. So they are, they are vendor specific formats. Every vendor can define their own formats uh, because they can, okay, there's nothing, they don't need to ask permission. Or X, those starting with an X are extension, non-standard extensions that can be used. So it's, actually it's a general mechanism of course, uh, the, the interest of the general web community is that uh, the set of different formats that, that is transferred is small. Huh? There's not just tra transfer files in every possible format, only in those ones that are understood or well understood by all the browsers. But the general mechanism is the same. If I'm transferring information between two applications of mine, two Python applications, then I can choose whatever file format I prefer. In the case in which one of the, the client application is a normal browser, of course, I will need to use only the, the normally accepted uh, types uh, for a browser. And uh, um, there are several headers that are used to describe the actual content of the file. The most important one is a content type. Content type is a response header that lists the, actually the, the type from this table that is currently being transferred right now. And then you may have different say, specifications on top of the content type. For example, the encoding may be ASCII, may be UTF, depending on the character set. Um, you may have different national languages. Uh, you may declare the length of the message if you know it in advance so that the browser can pre-allocate the buffers. These are all, I say, additional details. The main one is this content type that instructs the browser about how to decode the information which is received. Is this a zip file? Do I need to uncompress it? Is this a PDF file? Do I need to call the plugin to show it? or it's just HTML. The browser shouldn't decide this on the basis of the URL name, shouldn't decide this by on the basis of, of guessing the file content, it should only rely on the content type header. Okay, uh, let's not talk about authentication. So uh, a, a bit more details about the, main, the, the, the most important methods. We mentioned post. I won't mention head because it's just uh, not, not, very, not very used. The post method 
is uh, one of the two methods that, where we have a, a request body, the body in the request. And uh, so I'm, I'm not retrieving information, rather I'm sending information to the server. So usually the resource that we put in the request, so post resource name, will not be a resource to retrieve, but rather an application endpoint that is able to process the data that I'm sending. So it's usually a script for handling the post data. Uh, Every time we send a post, uh, we should assume that the server is doing some operation on that, uh, and if we, if we repeat the post, the effect will not be the same. So for example, if I'm sending a post for registering a new user, if I resend the same post one second after, probably I will get an error because the same user has already been registered. So instead of a get that can be repeated uh, without any side effect, uh, if the web server is program correctly, the post should not be repeated. We say that get it is idempotent. If you repeat it, you get the same result, while post isn't supposed to be idempotent. That's why sometimes the browser, when you go back in your history with the browser arrows, uh, ask you, do you want to resend? And they, they ask your permission because resending some data may change Maybe you can send an email a second time or something like that. Okay. Um, so far, this was uh, no, the usage of HTTP for delivering web content. But actually, we already have a very simple protocol uh, with a very, let's say, popular implementations. It's very easy to have uh, web servers available which is able already to transport many different types uh, of content. So why don't we use this protocol for uh, letting different uh, applications exchange data? Not necessarily a browser, but I have an application running on my computer, another application running on a different computer, they need to exchange data. We can use HTTP as a transport protocol. Um, I activate a web server on the other machine, and my application on my machine is doing some HTTP calls to the other one. It's not a browser, there's no interaction of the user. It's just the application that when they want to get some information, they retrieve it through HTTP. We need, for doing that, which is our target, we need to set some uh, rules. So how can we use uh, HTTP for letting these applications communicate? Thank you. Uh, there are different ways you can make, make your own, uh, but it's usually best uh, to follow some guidelines. So this is the, interest, the interesting part today. Uh, we build on top of the main HTTP methods and on the MIME types uh, to create uh, a new way uh, of uh, in, uh, information interchange between applications. This method is called REST. REST stands for Representational State Transfer. It has been invented by this body, and uh, if you see, it's a uh, very important person in the ecosystem of the, of the internet. Uh, he was uh, working in Adobe, in, Apa in the Apache Foundation, it big funds the, the Apache server. So uh, he is one that knows what HTTP is about. Uh, and his uh, PhD dissertation, actually, uh, analyzed how a systematic method for designing web servers able to offer services, APIs, programming endpoints to other applications. And uh, uh, the proposal is based on representational state, uh, means is that uh, using resource names 
to represent data, to represent information, and using HTTP verbs, commands, methods, to represent the operations that we want to do onto that information. REST is a way of thinking, a way of thinking your URLs, your resources, and coupled with the HTTP verbs. And this maps nicely to the HTTP protocol, and therefore, automatically, it's independent from the programming language, it's independent from the file format, and so on. So it's very easy with this REST, uh, uh, met, uh, let's say, philosophy or architecture, to integrate one application written in Python with another written in JavaScript, with another written in C Sharp. Uh, so for example, these are very useful if you want to have uh, one mobile application that is written in Java for Android or in uh, um, Objective-C for iOS and a website written in Python with a backend written in still a different language. So all the front ends are written in different languages, but they all access the same backend, which contains all the information, the database, the methods, and the user registration, and so on, on a still different language. All the communication happens over HTTP, and the data exchange isn't affected by the change of languages. Just imagine having a Python program exchange data with a C program. Hmm? Where to start from? Here we don't need to integrate this application. We may have applications in different languages, running on different computers. They just exchange HTTP messages. So we all start from the definition of a resource. So a resource, and the definition is very general, is anything that may have an identity. May have a user, may be a, a, a course, a room, a date, an appointment, page mail, every, every object you, you can think. Okay, you think, for example, when you're drawing entity relationship diagrams, when you're designing databases. Every entity is a resource, can be thought as a resource. It, it has, it contains different items that have an identity by themselves. So we normally think in HTTP to resources as web pages. Hmm? But here we can be more general. We can have a URL representing users. A user is a resource managed by the system, representing groups, representing devices, which are all information that will be managed in the database of the application. And you can describe it in a neutral way without talking about the database, without seeing the database tables, uh, um, or describing it in a general way just with URLs. So, you have this general conceptual mapping. The idea is that everything should be thought as a set of resources. You decide which are the main types of resources you have in your application or you want to offer. Um, for example, I'm thinking about the Twitter API, for example. Twitter has users, it has also messages, posts, it has retweet, retweets, it has images, and so on. So these are all the types of resources that we may have. Every type of resource will be described by a specific URL. So the list of the users will be something like, like twitter.com slash user. It doesn't map to any specific web page. It's just a name, a placeholder that describes that we want to talk about that resource. And every resource may have, or better should have, a representation. So if I'm thinking about a user, the representation of a user should contain all the data, all the information I have about that user. The first name, the last name, the email address, the website, and so on. And I should be able to exchange with the web server information containing this 
fields, this representation of the user. When I'm talking about, uh, of a resource, I'm talking something abstract, general. When I'm talking about the representation, I think about a specific file, a text file, an HTML file, an XML file, a JSON file, like, like we'll see in a, in, a, in a minute, that contains in a specific format the concrete inf representation in a file of the current content of that specific resource. Hmm? So the same resource may be represented in different format. Maybe the same application case will tell me, there are several uh, frameworks for doing that, can uh, switch dynamically with, uh, among different formats. Huh? The file that represents the user is not the user. It's one possible representation of the user, of the resource user. So we have these abstract resources that map to, to URLs. And we can use the HTTP verbs to exchange a representation of resources with different methods. So I can imagine a get method on a resource name that will retrieve the representation of the current value of that resource. I can imagine the post method of a resource that we send with the post I'm sending data, send a representation of a new object of that type of resource to be added. Hmm? So I'm using the HTTP verbs to describe what kind of operation I want to do with the resources. And of course, the HTTP request or response will travel in the body, will ship within their body a representation of the resource being retrieved or a representation of the resource being created or updated. Hmm? For example, imagine we want to describe something about uh, students and courses in the university. So uh, usually, if, if I'm sorry, to make it very simple, we have two main types of resources, individual items or collections of items. Uh, a collection of items also maps to the general type of, of items. So I, if I'm talking about the students of a university, this is a general concept of the resource student, but I'm also imagining a list of all the students. So when I'm defining an entity, or here they call it a resource, it implies that the resource contains many instances. So I can talk about a specific instance, a specific student, or the full list, or the full set, or the full class or entity, of all the students. So uh, we met them to URIs like this. Of course, we need to, to have a server name, and then slash students is the URI that describes uh, the collection of all the students. So when you see a URI, uh, an address like that, you think collection. What can you do with a collection? You can get the list of all the elements, you can add a new element, you can delete an element from a collection. If you want to describe information about one specific student, so a single item of a given type, of a given class, then you append, you create a URI that appends to the class name, the ID, an, an, uh, an identification string or number that is able to select one specific uh, item. One, in this case, one specific student. So this uh, identifier selects or describes or represents the resource of student number one, two, three, four, five, which is a resource of type students. So the address is very simple. Slash resource name represents a collection. Slash resource slash identifier represents an item. 
and everything can, this, can be described in, the, in these two methods. Courses, the list of all the courses. Courses code is the resource about that specific course. Classrooms, classroom 3i, and so on. Hmm? Uh, usually, by convention, the name of a resource uh, is written in the plural form. Students, courses, classrooms. Hmm? Uh, we tend to use uh, nouns and not verbs because we are, we are describing objects in some, in some way, entities, general entities, so they are, we are not associated with any actions. We are, we are describing the information that we have. And try to be as concrete as possible. Hmm? Courses, not items or, or generic names. Because, uh, what we want to have is uh, be, be able to understand, understand from the URL of a resource actually what it is about. If you call it the resources slash 37, it doesn't tell you what it is. Okay, and so what can you do on these addresses? So you can combine the address of a collection or the address of an item with the four main verbs of HTTP. So you can get a resource. If the resource is a collection, so get means retrieving the representation of the resource. If the resource is a collection, you retrieve the list of all the items. If the resource is one element, you retrieve the properties, the detail, details of that specific element. If you want, uh, if you use a, a post, you can, post means add new information. So you can add new information only to a collection. You cannot add to an existing element, because the element is already there. It does, it's, it's not a container for something else. So you may po uh, post, means add to a collection. What? What can you add to a collection? Another item, a new item. Uh, in the case of put, you can read it as replace. Okay, if you want to translate them, get is read, post is add, put is replace. So I can replace, update some information inside an element, or I can replace, if I use a, the URL of a collection, the whole set of a collection with another different set, which is rarely used. Then you, have, you also have delete, but try to use it sparingly. So the, the, the cheat sheet is like this. You may have collection uh, URL or a resource URL, an, an individual URL, like, like the second one. And you can use these four main verbs. Post means creating, adding, getting means reading, put means update, and delete means uh, delete. So if you post to a collection, you need to send to the collection a representation of a new dog in this case, and this new dog will be added to the collection of dogs. Posting to an item doesn't make any sense. You don't do it, okay? It's forbidden, it should generate an error. Getting, getting is easy, because if you get the ID of one specific element, you have the representation of that, the, all the information about that specific dog. If you get over a collection, well, it depends on the implementation, you may have just a list of all the IDs of every dog, if you want it to be short, or a list of the full details about all the dogs in the collection. Depends, in some, in some cases you may decide that all the details is too much, so when you get the collection, you only get the list of the IDs, and then if you want the detail, you ask them one by one with additional get on every, each and every ID. In some other cases, it's just quicker and easier, when you get on a collection, when you do a get on a collection, you get all the details about every element in the collection. 
it may become slower because the representation of uh, all the details about every element in the collection may be large and so may be slow to transfer. Put. Put is mainly used on individual elements. You send a new representation of a dog and will uh, the put will update the current values on that dog representation in the database in your system, your backend. Usually you can put a new representation only of an existing element. If this kind of dog doesn't exist yet, you cannot modify it, of course. If it exists, you can modify some fields of the dog, of the resource. You can modify any field except the, the identification number, of course. The, the, the ID can never change hmm? because it's used to identify this resource, so you cannot modify it. Um, it. In some cases, it may also be possible to use put on a collection. And in this case, the semantic would be replace the whole collection with another new one. So throw away all the elements in the collection and replace them with a new collection. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not very used. No? It's a quite a dangerous, dangerous operation. And then you may use delete. If you delete an item, you will just remove that item from the collection. If you're deleting a collection, actually you are emptying that collection. You mean that you want to empty that collection. So it's very easy for you if you have a database that hosts uh, the dogs or the users of the classrooms or the courses or the students to provide one, two, three, and four methods, maybe five and six. Read the collection, read one item, add one item, maybe update a single item, and maybe delete an item. You just implement these four methods that run on these uh, different uh, HTTP addresses. So imagine that in Python, route slash docs, route slash docs slash ID. You remember the dynamic routing that we saw last time that was quite useless last time, but now it becomes very handy. Because with the one single route, we can capture all the URLs of this format. And so all the, uh, and for every one, you can select what you can do when the request is post, when the, when the request is get, put, or delete. So for every type of object that you have in your application, you just have to define these four or five routes with four or five functions that will then enable anybody, any client application, to manipulate the information that you have in your server. For doing what? I don't know. I don't care. I'm offering to another application the visibility over my information and the capability of modifying my information. So I'm offering an API, an application programming interface, an interface that can be used by another program to access my own data, okay? In a standard way, right now we didn't think, we didn't speak about programming languages or any, anything else. We just spoke about standard HTTP messages and a convention over the definition of the URLs. Every language, that is able to implement a web server can actually offer a REST API. Every language that can implement an HTTP client can actually use a REST API. Okay? Um, there's one further detail, you know, from the design of databases that designing entities is just half uh, of the way to go. The other half is designing relationships. So having a list of students and a list of courses is not very useful if you cannot say which student is enrolled in which course and vice versa. 
So you need a way also in this REST let's say, scheme to map resources, sorry, to map relationships between different resources. And the syntax, again, is very easy. Uh, we use uh, uh, three elements. Resource, one identifier, another resource. This may represent any one-to-one -one or one-to-n or one-to-many relationship between different resources. So, students is the list of all the students. Students slash S123456 is the information about that specific student. Students S123456 slash courses is the list, is again a collection. You see that it's a, a plural noun, so it represents a collection. That specific collection of the courses taken by this specific student. So you start from the list of students, you select one, you land on that student, and then you, you get the list of all courses, so another entity type, that relate to that specific user. Hmm? So in that case, you have the list of all the ID of the courses. If you want, you can get the information about those separately. And also the other way around. I can have the list of all the courses, select one course, and given that course, uh, representing the list of all the students of that course. So this is a different query that I can make on the same data model. So what does it mean in combination with our HTTP methods? Well, if I'm doing a get, let's concentrate on the first one. Students, let's one, two, three, four, five courses. I get, I guess the list of the course codes. Then if I want some details about the code, I need to have it, make a separate gate, get on slash courses slash course code. I can, the, the, the convention is that I will not append a fourth element here, just to select the specific course. There's no redundancy here. There's no different ways of describing the same resource. The course is always slash courses slash 01 PRD even if we are talking about the course taken by the student. So the information about the course is the canonical representation. Every type of information can only be written in one way with these conventions. What do you do if I try to make a put for the first, uh, to the first address? What does it mean to put uh, onto this address? So putting on this address means adding what? A course, because this URL represents courses. Adding a course, where? To the list of courses taken by the student. So this means enrolling the students in the course. I'm not creating a new course here. I'm creating a new association between the, an existing course and the student. So I'm adding a new association, a new relationship between the course that I'm giving you and the, 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 the student that has been named here. By the way, if I do a put of a student to the second URL, I have the same effect. In this case, we have a many-to-many -many relationship, and we can, in this case, I can add a course to this list of courses taken by a student, or I can add a student to the list of students taking the course. The, the effect will be the same. Hmm? Adding a new relationship between that student and that core. I can see it from the student point of view or from the course point of view, the effect of this put should be the same if I implement it correctly. If I do a delete here, well, let's, let's hope I, I don't do it because I, I, will, uh, I will disenroll the student from all of its courses. I can do a put just to modify, to update the set of courses that is enrolled in. So uh, we have just, you see, you have, we have the combination of three different uh, resource names. Collections, elements, individual elements, and relationships, three. Combined with these four different verbs, get, put, post, and delete, 
and we try to describe everything that can be done in our application by using only these uh, 12 combinations. Less than those because uh, some of them doesn't make, don't, don't, don't make sense. Okay, so this is a, a way of thinking. If you, if we are able to describe all the operations that can be done on our application by using this framework, these three types of URLs and these four types of comments, then we are say, following the REST pattern and it will be easier for other people to uh, understand how to use our application. There's only one final detail which is missing, the representation format. But right now we, we said, okay, we need to get a representation of the list in some format, or the details of an element, or to put a, a copy, a description, a representation of the new students to describe. What is the representation format? Well, the rest architecture doesn't care. As long as the representation format is understood both by the client and the server. Any format can be uh, used. Hmm? Of course, you need to declare in your HTTP request headers or in your HTTP response headers the correct content type so that uh, the format that you're sending can be understood and uh, the application is prepared to decode, to receive and to decode that specific format. Uh, there are different ways. Uh, if, if your application can work with different formats, there are different ways uh, of specifying that. No? For example, in the request, you can say, okay, we want a response in this format, JSON, that we, are, we see in a moment. Or you just append a fake extension to the resource name. This looks like a file name. Actually, there's no file name existing. This is the resource ID, 123456, and .json is just a hint for the server by saying, okay, please respond me in JSON format, or by some explicit qualification like this. So there's not really a standard for that. Mm -hmm. So every application, every REST API has a way, in some cases, specifying the format in which uh, information is transferred. Um, for example, these are the example of some uh, websites, like for example Flickr, that use this or similar representation to this uh, to represent the resources. Um, this is not purely, uh, let's say, REST, but uh, it's the address, slash the server ID, this two, and slash the resource ID. And then the extension means the format in which you want the file. You can change extension and the Flickr API will convert the file for you on the fly. And if you want to add one file, you put on this address. If you want to retrieve the file, you get and you receive the image. Uh, if, you, if you want, uh, you can have a look at this uh, API documentation. M many websites, many on online websites, uh, offer some kind of API that are mostly based on the REST pattern. Some are more, say, uh, follow more closely the REST guidelines, uh, and some are different. So it, they also they are also more difficult to understand because they, they you, you need to understand the mind of the developers. Okay. So if you want to integrate your application with another website, first check if they have an API based on HTTP. If they have, it means that you can interact with them just by exchanging these messages according to these general guidelines. Uh, in many cases, uh, you will also already find some Python library that composes the messages for you and retrieves them for you by dropping the, um, the, 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 the REST APIs. Another one uh, is Twitter, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the links down here point to the, to the definition of, of the APIs. 
uh, Google Calendar again, hmm? for example, we can, we can see this one because it's well documented, for example. If I have five minutes or less. You see, resource types. It uses the, the, the right, right terminology. We have different resource types. ACL stands for access control list, calendars, events. So for example, I can have uh, events are the content of the calendar. So it tells me how an event is represented. So what are the attributes? This is the representation of an event the actual file that describes the content of an event when you put it onto a, onto a Google Calendar. And you have uh, uh, what happens when you get the, the supported method. You can have a get, do a get on a calendar. So this is the URL. The events is the collection. Event ID is the individual event. This is scoped, of course, by one calendar, because this API allows you to have access to different calendars. So the first part is just uh, the, your domain, selecting the calendar, and then resource events, uh, item event ID. And it tells you, okay, the parameters that you can send, and uh, the response that you can imagine to have. And in this case, you also have examples on how to call this API from different programming languages uh, using the already the, the Python library provided by Google in this case. Uh, but so it's all uh, uh, based on, uh, on, on HTTP. If I list events, I am using the events, you see this is the collection URL, events without an ID. And you will retrieve the list of, of events according to some additional filters. So the maximum number of results ordered by, minimum date, maximum date will be later, and so on. So all the type of operations that you can do on a calendar are described in terms of REST URLs so are resource names, and the meaning of the HTTP commands on those, uh, uh, on those resource names. So it's a common way of describing application, even complex ones. Okay, so, um, okay, these are other examples that we may skip. Um, okay, let me go here. So we said uh, we more or less understand how to represent the resources, map resources to your eyes and give interpretation to the different HTTP, HTTP verbs to support all the operations that we want to support in our application. Of course, we need to select one possible or many, more than one if you want, but at least one possible uh, representation format. Uh, in the internet today, the most common representation format for encoding information is JSON. What, uh, JSON is very easy, very as a minimal language, which is used for representing data. The name JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. So it comes from the JavaScript but it will look familiar also to, to us uh, that we are working in Python because the syntax is uh, quite similar. It came from JavaScript, but actually today there are, there are libraries for every programming language to read and write files in JSON format. So it's a generic formatting uh, protocol, let's say, uh, that allows us to represent in, in, a text, in a text format any kind of data structure. So it's very easy. It's not uh, so lengthy as an XML format. It's not so complex as any binary format. It's just a text format in which you list uh, 
the property. It's easy to read and write uh, both for humans and for machines. JSON is only has two types of data structures, collections and arrays. A collection is, uh, well, in Python we, we would call it dictionary. A list of key value elements. A collection, a, a collection or an object, uh, in, let's call it dictionary, Don't, we, we can, no, there are different ways of calling that in, in different languages, okay? It's uh, designed in, in braces and it has a collection of many items, it contains many items, each, each of them with a different key, like a dictionary. Uh, an array or a list in JSON is similar to a list in, uh, in Python, it has square brackets, and it contains elements that are uh, listed in order. So you can have a first, a second, third, and three. so they are indexed by position and not by key. You can combine these two to create any kind of information, any kind of structure. Let's go back, for example, to our previous event description when we came here. So I try to decode this. Uh, this is a representation in JSON of a Google, of a Google Calendar event, right? Opening brace means a dictionary. And these are key and value, key and value, key and value for all the dictionary items. So it, by the way, it's also, it's also the same syntax that we, we would use in Python to create a dictionary. Key, colon, value, comma. Hmm? So it's a dictionary containing, for example, creator is a complex resource, which is again another dictionary of four different fields. Organizers is another dictionary and so on. Recurrence is an array of strings. It's an array of strings. Original start time is a, is a dictionary, a structure containing the date, the day time, and the zone, time zone, and so on. The list of attendees, an event, you are creating an event, you are trying to combine four different people in the same event. It is a list of dictionaries, so one dictionary for every in between, uh, the, um, let's say participant to the event, and all of them are in a list. So we are describing quite complex structures, an event that may contain different people, and we also have the information about the different people. All of this is uh, composes the description, the representation in REST language, language, the representation of the event resource. So every event, if I'm putting it, I need to prepare a JSON like this and send it to the server. If I'm, or a subset of these fields, if I don't need all of them. If I'm getting a, a, an event, I will have one file with this format. Uh, so I just combine and can nest in any way uh, dictionaries or objects or collections and lists. The difference is that, oh, remember, dictionaries have a colon specifying the key and lists are just a, a comma separated list of items. Every item in a list can be another list, can be another dictionary or can be just a simple data. So the, this is a full grammar of JSON, it's very simple. Everything you can do in JSON is to create objects, dictionary, so open brace, key, column, value, comma, we have more. And we loop until we close the brace. Or if we create arrays, open square bracket, value, comma, value, comma, value, until we close the, the, uh, the square bracket. And inside these values can be either objects or array, or there are only two basic data types. 
number, string. Everything boils down to number, which are integral or real, they make no difference, it's just called number, or string. So it's a very simple language. In a text format, you can describe complex structure with deep nesting also, by using very few, only two data types, string, number, and two uh, type operators, the dictionary and the list. And this, of course, uh, abstract or JSON format map, will map it to specific uh, uh, construct in your language, in your programming language. So maybe in Java, uh, it will be an array list. Uh, in Python, it will be a collection list and uh, for, for a square array. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, if you have a, a brace, so a collection, in, in Python, it will map to a dictionary. In Java, it will map to a hash map, for example. Every language has have different data structures for representing this kind of information nesting. JSON is a, a simple format, but above all, is a neutral format. It doesn't depend on a specific language. So you can actually start from one language, comp uh, having your data, your objects in your languages, in your language, compose a JSON that describes those, and this JSON can go to another application, which in a completely different language will recreate their own data structures that map the same information. Okay? This is what we do every day when we are integrating uh, different applications. We define the set of APIs, so the resources, the URLs for the resources, and the kind of get, put, post, and delete verbs that we support on every uh, collection, item, or uh, relationship. And then for every element type, for every item type, for every resource type, we define how to serialize them in JSON. So the, set, the pattern is always the same. In the next hour, I see Luigi is already waiting there. Uh, we will see an exa a specific example of how to create an API on HTTP, REST, and JSON for our, guess what, the to-do list application. Now, a little break. Thank you. <laughs>